Um, I noticed a big hole in the front here. And um, I don't think I spit that far. I don't know why people are not sitting in the front. If this was my classroom, only Song Hyun and Stella would be getting an A+. Plus. Amen. Others, you start from B and under. Anyways, um, it's good to see all of you this morning. Welcome once again. Um, thank you for that beautiful music from the orchestra. Uh, one of the things that I hear frequently from um, the visiting family, the visitors in our church, is that they always say, and I heard this last night also, and they say, Pastor, I've noticed there's so much talent and potential, those who have so much talent in your church. I, I have never been to any church like this before. So um, thank you to all those who are on the stage, behind the stage, you know, before the stage, and whatever, as you prepare for um, the worship and um, serving God. It is already the last day of August. Can you believe it? Two-thirds have gone by. We have started a new semester already. And today is the last day of August. We are excited for the next new four months of this year. Time flies. And uh, we pray for God's blessings and guidance for throughout the rest of the year for 2019. Some announcements, lunch, finally we get to taste the worldwide famous SUIC lunch starting today, right upstairs. So you don't need to walk 10 minutes, exercise is good, but, um, but it's right upstairs, so right after church, um, please join us for lunch. And this afternoon there's Pathfinders, we are restarting the Pathfinder program as we embark on this last one-third of this year. And please join us in the afternoon. What time is it, Elder John? 1.30. 1.30 and 1.21, yes. right? 1.30 this afternoon, 1.21, please um, join us for Pathfinders um, this afternoon. We're excited for that also. Yeah. Well, this morning, the title of the sermon, the message is called, what is it, everyone? Are what are you doing here? What are you doing here? If you have a Bible, please let's open up to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19. And nowadays you say, please unlock your phones to open to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, we go from verse 9 through 10. Those of you who don't have your Bibles, it's up on the screen for you also. Here we go. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9. And ten. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, turned down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. The question this morning, what are you doing here? When was the last time you heard this question? What are you doing here? Was it a pleasant situation? Or was it where you were, where you were not supposed to be? Think about it. What are you doing? It's not, oh, what are you doing here? But rather it's, what are you doing here? Right? Someone gets angry at you or you are in a place, or the wrong place, and you hear this voice. What are you doing here? Long, long time ago, I remember hearing, what are you doing here? Long, long time ago, and um, that was when I was in kindergarten, five years old or six years old. And um, it's not possible now, but back in those days, it was possible. Um, so don't try it, kindergartners. You know, I used to go to kindergarten, and then 
come right back home. Because uh, my parents, both of them were working. My older brother would go to school. So sometimes I would pretend going to kindergarten, but come right back home. It doesn't work nowadays. It's illegal. Don't try it. And I would have the house all by myself. Isn't that amazing? Good old days, huh? Five-year-old boy having the house all by myself. I would go through the community, the village, and talk to people and see all these things. Just walk around all day. But most of the times, there was a reason why I came back home. It was because I would look for some coins. And then what would I do with the coins? I would go to a market right in front of our house. And without competition with my brother, without getting permission from my parents, what would I do? I would choose whatever I want to eat. In the good old days. This one day, I chose to have an ice cream that morning. I had it in my hand, and right before I took the first bite, I felt a familiar hand on my shoulder. Uh-oh. And then I heard this voice. Rhino, what are you doing here? I'm in trouble. The familiar voice of my dad. I guess they found out that I was running away and going all these places. He came back from work. He pretended he was going to work. He came back. I pretended to go to kindergarten. I came back. We met. What are you doing here? And, and this question you can interpret in many ways. What are you doing here? What does that mean? You, a kindergartner, <laughs> pastor's kid, you doing here. Or you can say, what are you doing here? What was I doing? I was not studying. I was not learning. I was about to have that ice cream. What are you doing here? Not in kindergarten. Not at school. But in front of this market. What are you doing here? Elijah received the same question from God. And we're going to embark on this journey this morning about this story. If we rewind a little bit, one chapter, let's go back one chapter to 1 Kings chapter 18. Rewind and go back to 18. This is a glorious and victorious story. We all know the story, right? This prophet named Elijah, he was on a battle against how many prophets of Baal and Asherah? 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ezra. So if you do their map, how many? 850. One versus 850 prophets of other gods. It's like one pastor of Adventist church fighting against 850 other denomination pastors. You know the story, right? If you go to 1 Kings chapter 18, let's open there. Let me read you some verses here. 1 Kings chapter 18, 21. And Elijah came to all the people in Mount Carmel. They were all gathered to see who, which God is the real God. Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, Follow him. And then they go on a religious battle. The prophets of Baal, they would cry out for fire to their altar. They cried out all day, but nothing happened. And then Elijah comes up. And Elijah says what? Pour water on this altar. Second time, pour it again. Again, third time. And then they drained the trenches even. 
And when Elijah prayed, there was fire from heaven. This great victory in 1 Kings chapter 18. And notice what it says. After the victory, verse 39, now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But notice here, after this great victorious moment of this prayer being answered, a fire coming down from heaven, how can we explain verses 3 and 4 of chapter 19? Notice what it says, and when he saw that, when he saw what? If you look before, Zezebel sent the messenger and said, I'm going to kill you. And when he heard that message, when he saw that, he arose and noticed this victorious great prophet. What did he do? Ran for his life. And came and sat under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. For I am no better than my father. Just the other day in chapter 18, he prayed and prayer came down from heaven. Just the other day he prayed and three and a half year drought ended. Some time ago in chapter 17, he prayed and a boy came back to life. But notice what it says here. He ran for his life. He cried out to God, Lord, just kill me. Take my life. Sounds like Jonah, huh? After his success in chapter 1 and 2 and 3, in chapter 4, you see him crying out, complaining to God, Lord, take my life. Elijah, after his great victory, he says, Lord, take my life. He prayed that he might die. After witnessing all the miracles, after experiencing, after being in the center of the miracle and the work of God. Yet Elijah runs away. He runs away. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever wanted to run away from something or someone? Yes. <laughs> yes. I know you've been there. I've been there. Same as Elijah. To run and run and run from all the dramas and the problems, the situations, from people. To run away from frustrations and just be alone in a quiet place. We've been there, right? We've been there. Or sometimes you, you're so lo you feel so lonely that you take out your phone and you want to just pour out your heart to someone. And you go from the list of your phone on contacts from A to Z. There's like five, six hundred people on your phone. But at that moment, during your lowest time of your life, in that dark tunnel, you look for someone to talk to and there is not a single person to talk to. You've been there. I've been there. Elijah also was in that state. Notice here, Prophets of Kings 162, into the experience of who? All. all. Experience of all. There come times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. Days when sorrow is the portion and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children. It is then that the many lose their hold on God and are brought into the slavery of doubt and bondage of unbelief. One day you are a leader of the church, you, s you do all the work, you are very faithful, and the next day you are filled with doubt and unbelief. We've been there before. Elijah had this experience. Maybe Elijah realized that it was better off living in the wilderness by himself rather than living with the people of God. 
Sometimes we think, oh, it's better to just keep the faith by myself rather than go to church and deal with all of the difficult problems and difficult people. But notice in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah runs away and away and away. He runs to the caves. He runs to the wilderness and different places. And finally, after 40 days and 40 nights, he goes to this mountain, Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai. We know this place, right? Mount Sinai. After 40 days and 40 nights, he goes to no other place, but he goes, arrives at Mount Sinai, where it all began. You know, Mount Sinai is a place where God spoke through what? Through thunders, through wind, through fire. And also, it is a place where God gave the commandments. It is a place where God made a covenant with the people. Elijah goes there and he says, God, everything is different now. Everything is different. The people have broken the covenant. The people are worshiping idols. They don't believe in you anymore. They don't keep the commandments anymore. Everything is different. He goes back to the place where it all began. And then God asks this question, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? So many ways, right? So many ways to interpret and understand this question. What are you? Your identity. For Elijah, it was his prophetic identity. Doing here. What are you doing here? Focusing on his action of running away. What are you doing here? This place. The people are all over there. What are you doing here by yourself hiding? And then God speaks. He doesn't speak through a storm or a wind or a fire. He speaks to Elijah by what? Through whisper, small whisper. Ask this question again, twice. God whispers this question. He says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? If you look in the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 19, this is the complaints, the answer to this question that Elijah gives to God. God asks, what are you doing here? And Elijah answers, Verse 14, and he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. I have done my best. I have done my best serving as an elder of a leader of the church, of a head deacon, head deacons of the church, of a team leader, mission team leader of the church. I have done my best. But three complaints. Number one, the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Number two, torn down your altar. And number three, they killed your prophets with a sword. Three complaints, realistic complaints. And then he goes on, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. That's why I'm running away. That's why I am hiding here. If you go on, if you continue with verse 15, 16, and so on, God answers to these complaints. Fifteen, sixteen, eighteen. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. We'll take a look at that later. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And then, yet I have reserved 
How many? Seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Three complaints. God gives Elijah three solutions and answers to this realistic complaints. First, let's take a look. They have forsaken your covenant. There's no one else. They have all disobeyed. They have betrayed you, God. But notice what God says. His answer, nope. You're not alone. There's how many more? There's 7,000 that have not forsaken my covenant. There's 7,000 7, that have not bowed to Baal. Notice here, Prophets and Kings 171, on this story, yet this apostasy, widespread as it has come to be, is not universal. Not all in the world are lawless and sinful. Not all have taken sides with the enemy. God has many thousands who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even today, many who long to understand more fully in regard to Christ and the law. And notice here, you might be surprised and shocked maybe. And there are many who have been worshipping Baal, what? Ignorantly. But with whom the Spirit of God is still striving. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's work to do, folks. Amen. There are many who have been worshipping Baal ignorantly. It is our responsibility and our mission. But God, the Spirit of God is still striving. Complaints, forsaking your covenant. There's 7,000 more. You are not alone. Number two, they tore down your altars. They were disgraceful. They don't respect worship. They take it lightly. They don't take it seriously about worshiping you, God. This was the complaint. The answer, solution to this complaint was anoint Hazael as king over Syria. And if you look throughout the Old Testament after 1 Kings 19 and Chronicles, you can see that this king is used by God to take care and to punish those who tore down the altars. Solution number two. Number three, they killed your prophets. They killed your prophets. And what does God say? There's more. Anoint who? Elisha. As a prophet. To take your place. Anoint Elisha. Number one, forsaking your covenant. We don't see the big picture, right? Only God does. Sometimes you feel we are alone, we are lonely, we don't deserve anything. But our sights are so narrow. God sees the big picture and he says what? There's 7,000 more. Amen. Here's the big picture. The second complaint, they tore down your altars. But God sees the future. Complaint number three, they killed your prophets. But God has a plan. He knows others. He knows people that Elijah didn't know. In other words, whatever situation we are in, even this morning, right now, whatever state of mind, whatever challenges, whatever fears and doubts that go through our hearts, we may have been active in church before, of serving the church in God, but now you may be discouraged by something or someone. You may be serving the church right now, but inside your hearts, you are at the lowest point of your life. No matter the situation, doubts and fears, and you may want to run and hide, just like Elijah. Let's remember that God sees what we don't see yet. God has a big picture compared to our narrow-sighted mind. He prepares people to work with you and to help you. 
Three complaints from Elijah, and three answers and solutions from God. The question this morning, once again, what are you doing here? On the surface level, it may be asking about the present situation. It's a present tense. But it's also, the question, what are you doing, is also God's way to point to the past. To go back to the basics. To remember who you were and how God had used you. At the same time, the question, what are you doing here, points us and directs us to the future. It points Elijah to where he has to go. The mission and commission that God wants him to accomplish in the future. If you look through uh, 1 Kings 18 and 19, it's a complete contrast of how people view God. In chapter 18, after that victory in Mount Carmel, people were crying out, Lord, you are God. Baal and Asherah and other gods, they are just gods. According to them, it's not a capital, but a lowercase God. G. But our God, Prophet Elijah's God, capital God, the only living God. Amen. But in chapter 19, just imagine what, 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 what the people would think. This great prophet, what did he do? He ran for his life. You know, people might say, what's going on? God was being mocked at and laughed at. They were, they were spreading rumors about this prophet running away and hiding. Just imagine. It was a comical scene in chapter 19. But this morning, here's the question. Where was God when Elijah was running away? Think about it for a moment. Where was God when Elijah was in this dark tunnel of his life. When he was depressed and disappointed and hiding in the cave, where was God? If, if I was God, if, I would have been furious. I did everything, I gave you all the power, after all these miracles and people were praising and giving glory to me, now what? You're bringing disgrace to me. You ran away. You deserted your faith. I would be angry. And then I would be thinking, oh, okay, forget about him. There's how many more? 7, There's 7,000 more. Forget about Elijah. There's 7,000 more. <clears throat> but notice what it says. Prophets of Kings 167. The weary and discouraged prophet was not left to struggle alone. At the entrance to the cave where Elijah had taken refuge, what did he do? God met with him. Through a mighty angel sent to inquire into his needs and to make plain the divine purpose for Israel. The question this morning, what are you doing here? It's not a question of sarcasm or of anger. If you read through chapter 19, God sends angels, God sends food, continuously to give him energy and strength to run away, even. And then he comes, not in a shouting voice, but in a tender, kind, small whisper, says, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? The important takeaway this morning is, that God was with Elijah all the way, no matter what the situation was. He thought he was alone, hiding in the cave, as he was running, as he was walking in the wilderness. He thought he was alone, but God was with Elijah all the way. All throughout the time when this runaway prophet was hiding, God was with him all the way. Isn't that something? Amen? It's a very simple story. 
Simple conclusion. But something that we neglect most of our lives in our spiritual journey. Well, this morning, God is on a chase. 25, 26, 2700 years later, God is still on the chase. In fact, this chase started in the Garden of Eden, Eden, right? And the chase is going on and on and on. He is in the business of chasing and being with his sons and daughters. Not just Elijah, not just the prophet, but he is on a chase for you and I this morning. And you can be sure that God uses every mean possible to give you strength, to be with you, and to, and to help you move on in this life. God is on a chase. Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit is on a chase this morning for you and I. And He asks us this morning, not in an angry way, He asks this question this morning to us. What are you doing here? Also, what are you doing here? And what's the last question? What are you doing here? Thank you.